Towards the end of 2011, the movie New Year's Eve promised audiences something truly unique by featuring an ensemble of A-list actors in the same type of roles they always play for a movie that they don't particularly care about. I'm not saying Robert De Niro was sleeping on the job, although he was laying down in every scene, and I'm pretty sure they just wheeled him onto set in the same hospital bed he sleeps in at home. With Leah Michelle, Katherine Heigl, and several other actors who you may not have seen appear in a new movie since well before the world ended two years ago. I loved watching another movie by director Gary Marshall, who always fascinates me with his cinematic trademarks. Here, he captured all of the magical moments of New Year's Eve in Manhattan, such as sharing a midnight kiss with your fella, being forcibly kissed by a new beau at midnight, or slapping a guy twice before midnight kissing him. Uh, they forgot to include a scene of some young lady in an alleyway peeing through her pantyhose, because I saw that every New Year's that I lived in New York. In fact, at age 19, during the winter of 2010, I filled out hours of paperwork to be an extra in this very movie, until for whatever reason, I was unceremoniously cut after the scene they placed me in was rescheduled. Well, joke's on you, Gary Marshall, and not just because I outlived you. Using the profit from this clip breakdown, I can hopefully afford to buy myself the free lunch you took away from me 12 years ago. And guess what? I can use a porta potty in the freezing cold anytime I want at those construction zones that I creep around in at night. So you just think about that while we get glam. Check the eyeshadow and the liner. For the night of 1,000 cameos in a 2010's New Year's nibble of clip breakdown. <laughs> Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other content here on the web to say, Happy New Year, you can go to hell. Or you're the Grand Marshal at our Gary Marshall Grand Parade. Yeah, that's gonna work for that. That's gonna suffice. Uh. You already know I'm obsessed with Gary Marshall as a director who did Princess Diaries 1, 2, Pretty Woman, lots of movies, and they all kind of have a lot in common. So before we get into it, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up. That way I know you want to see more clip breakdowns like this, but most importantly, if you're new to my channel or some of you just are watching and not subscribing and that's really fun. But imagine if you click subscribe, that way you'll never miss when I upload two new videos every week. So click that subscribe button and turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know when I'm saying happy new year, get the hell out, get the hell out. Also, I've got merch and a Patreon where you can access exclusive episodes and bonus content. Obviously, this movie all takes place within one day, New Year's Eve, and it follows several intertwining stories, very similar to Gary Marshall's Valentine's Day, with lots of actors such as Taylor Swift, Taylor Lautner, that's all I'm remembering right now, but I know Michael Pena was in it. This movie, New Year's Eve, was originally meant to be a straight-up sequel using the same main characters, but they ended up recasting with mainly Katherine Heigl and Hilary Swank as the biggest, you know, probably parts in this whole thing, although it is pretty even. I loved seeing Sarah Jessica Parker, Abigail Breslin, she's a fave, Jake T. Austin from Wizards of Waverly Place. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm just so excited because it's New Year's Eve. I was gonna do this video for actual New Year's Eve, but mama, holidays, hard. Another chance to turn not the Vienna Boys Choir castrados coming in with the most made up as they go sounding Christmas tune. It's New Year's Day, a resolution can be found. We do our skincare every morning now, okay. Also, way to feature all of New York's most iconic landmarks, such as the weird Christmas lights statue that they use to keep people without houses from sleeping outside in the financial district. They love those giant ornaments. Back then I was like, okay, Ari, honey, I shrunk the kids ghost Christmas. Some people swear there's no beauty left in the world, no magic. Then how do you explain the entire world coming together on one night? No, how do you explain your belief that this is even almost what happens on New Year's? I would hate to interrupt this mysteriously disembodied inner dialogue from Hilary Swank's character, but first of all, the entire world celebrates midnight of December 31st at vastly different times, and many cultures don't even consider that date to be their official New Year. I feel like Christmas Eve is a much more concrete date for for the entire world to be feeling a collective sense of magic. So why doesn't Gary Marshall make a star-studded ensemble film about that? Hold on. 
Oh, my ghost producer Daryl is reminding me that Gary Marshall has died, which actually explains why he hasn't cast me in The Princess Diaries 3, despite all those 8x10 boudoir photos I've been sending him monthly. And yes, you heard right, my ghost intern Daryl has been promoted to producer, mostly to prevent her from suing me for wrongful death. Anyway, did I tell you that New York f***ing loves New Year's or whatever? Today we want to see a show of strength from the New York City Police Department. And by show of strength, we mean a full body stop and frisk for any person of color that you decide is being drunk or disorderly. All right, NYPD, time for your group photo. Remember, we want the cops in the front with the most bodies on their gun so that they can hold the professionalism, courtesy, and respect banner. We meet Hillary Swang's character. She is the vice president of the Times Square Alliance and therefore controls the whole ball dropping situation. I remember as a kid them explaining the ball drop to me and trying so hard to stay up till midnight to see it. And then when it happened, I was like, that's not really a ball and it's not really dropping. It's like a big metal multifaceted sculpture, which is nice, but I didn't get it. It also certainly isn't dropping so much as it's slowly lowering on a motor. Ew, my hands right now, stop. Anyway, you're up, Hillary. You mind giving us a sound bite from the newscast? No, I'd be happy to. <laughs> Ma'am, you are the VP of this incredibly large organization. It never once occurred to you to just use some powder blush on the day of the big ball drop? I'm more than okay with people who prefer a natural look, but if she's aware of the military prisoner makeup artist secret of pinching your cheeks to give them color, she knows enough to save herself the trouble by swiping on some NARS orgasm before getting on camera. I don't know why, but the fact that this movie would even show a modern woman pinching her cheeks for color proves that this whole screenplay was written by hetero men who are alive in the Dickensian era. Are you Mary Mother Todd Lincoln up in here scratching your face to make them blush? Like, don't. Paint it on. Look at this. See if you understand right off the bat that this character's a little uh, foolish. Over a billion people from all over the world will have their eyes on us tonight as the ball drops. Am I looking in the right spot for camera? Oh, um, or radio. What is that, like a Spotify podcast, but for people who hate having control over their lives? Sounds like a thriving medium. And I don't want any radio broadcast journalists getting angry at me down in the comments, okay? If you are all so good at your jobs, then why has nobody exposed me yet for my tax fraud? See, I'm even dropping little breadcrumbs for you, cause guess what, mama needs the publicity. I'm just kidding, obviously I pay my taxes. It's my greatest pleasure on this planet. I forgot to say, Michelle Pfeiffer is in this, playing a very similar character to who she would have been before before becoming Catwoman in the Batman movies. Are you all right, lady? Shut up, Gary Marshall's daughter. I'll be all right when you get a line in a movie that isn't being directed by your dad. Ow, my apologies to Kathleen Marshall. For Christmas, I gifted myself a shock collar that alerts me when I've been carelessly cruel to a child. But the joke's on you, kiddos, because that shock collar is in a wadded up ball inside my and suddenly, every time I call you stupid, it's a win-win. L Fanning could kill Dakota Fanning in a fight. Ooh, light me up, Sergeant. Oh, next we meet Zac Efron, who is a bike messenger, and he's going over to this major record label that's at Rockefeller Center. Oh, oh, hey, happy new year. Happy new year. This movie makes it seem mm, super normal for men to just bother women that they think are pretty out in public. Like, why don't you take that great clips haircut and ride your bike into a trash compactor, sir? It's like that scene at the beginning of The Poltergeist where all of these construction workers are hitting on a 16 year old girl and the mom is watching from the window like, <laughs> that daughter of mine surrounded by predators. Anyway, let's meet these two. <laughs> the first literally 25 minutes of this movie is setting up all of the different plot lines. And yes, that contributes to the two hour runtime of the total movie, but also it takes away from our ability to get to know or care about any of these characters. Just sign this, but you can't check in until tonight. We're gonna win the money. Oh, of course you are. What money? Oh, the first baby delivered in the new year at this hospital gets 25 grand. What hospital in New York? City or you giving birth sap baby burka boob Sarah Paulson. It is Willy Wonka and the goddamn baby factory up in here. If they are charging uninjured people $50,000 just to have a baby and not die, just so they can turn around and give half that to some couple who happens to give birth close to midnight. I feel like most of the plot points in a Gary Marshall movie are just strange old timey PR stunts like businesses would use to get written up in the newspaper. Newsflash Hollywood producers, even in 2011, 
2011, the biggest readership of printed newspapers came from pet snakes whose enclosures were lined with the sports pages to use as a toilet. But whatever. We know that this is the plot of these two, Seth Meyers and Jessica Biel, trying to have their baby before Sarah Paulson and her partner, played by someone, played by Till Schweiger. Okay, let's figure out how to induce. I will ask the internet I right now. This could pay off my student loan. Did they literally add in Seth Meyers' entire character motivation via an off-screen line recorded in a sound booth? I guess test audiences didn't respond well to this pair of yuppie-looking Manhattan dwellers prioritizing a cash prize over the health of their newborn baby. That husband said, 25 grand if my wife gives birth early? Excuse me, nurse, can you point me and this pregnant woman towards your slipperiest staircase? We see, what's his name, Zac Efron talking on the phone with Ashton Kutcher, his friend, so we get a taste for how these stories will kind of be interconnected, but not in a meaningful way, so don't worry about that. We have to do something. It's not an option. What are you still in this anti-New Year's kick, bro? Not a kick. It's a core tenet of my being. Being anti-New Year's is a core tenet of your being? I guess that's a thing. Although some people choose stuff like helping others. It's absolutely astonishing to me that Ashton Kutcher's entire character is just that he's a comic book artist who vehemently hates this one holiday eve in particular. I mean, I get that some people hate the idea of going out on New Year's Eve, but this guy seems like he woke up mad about it. Although I would also be pissed off if somebody decorated the hallways of the apartment for their New Year's party, especially if it's a full day in advance. The hallway is the way you get into your home. It's not part of your home, okay? That's why I tell myself it's okay to take other people's Amazon packages. I'll call you back. Save your minutes. Now we're talking. Okay, that was childish. Don't say save your minutes when you know full well that he got a free month of Boost Mobile Unlimited talk from his mom for Christmas. The banner thing is also tacky, but I mean, cis hetero men feel entitled to commit this type of vandalism all the time, so why should we be surprised? Congrats, you made your own hallway look more crappy. Have you relived your dorm experience enough yet? Because soon you'll meet Leah Michelle, and she's just trying to live her life as an aspiring singer in New York City with a character and theater theatrically spacious industrial loft apartment set copy and pasted directly from the fourth season of Glee. Wow, sometimes I don't even know how I talk so fast. Like what the f did I even just say? <laughs> Could you even understand that? <laughs> Could you even understand me? Are you smart enough to even understand the 12 words I said? <laughs> That's what I sound like. We go over to Josh Duhamel's storyline easily. Oh, my least favorite. He's like watching his friend get married. I don't know why they're having a small eloped daytime chapel thing. I don't care. You're the last of us, Sam. Roam the plains of Manhattan. Manhattan and carry on the legacy of late night bar hopping and casual sex with random women in good shoes. Mm. Which Rory will never know again. Mm. Wow lady, way to talk about your own shoe game like that. I could never. Have some self-respect. This guy is at his own wedding, standing next to his bride being like, ugh, now that I'm married, I can only have boring sex with one less attractive woman for the rest of my life. And the wife is like, that's right, and I agree with him. It's like the women in this movie are just written to be however the men see them. The characters who are women are either portrayed to be the ethereal, perfect love of a man's life, or just a nameless, faceless airhead who wears a strappy dress and wants sex. And I'm just like, okay, but they're both 112 pound white women. So the only real difference between them is where they attend Soul Cycle. I would love some like body diversity in this movie or even some LGBTQIA plus diversity or even just black characters who are allowed to experience joy rather than suffering. But whatever, an up and coming Sofia Vergara is in this. Jensen. That's Jensen's bus. <laughs> See? <Be> Jensen. <laughs> Keep jumping! You're very sexy, but don't stop! Bouncy, bouncy, bouncy! I can't decide what is more hilarious, that one of these characters has breasts or that both of them have non-English accents. Maybe it's just a coincidence that the two English as a second language characters in this film are made out to basically be clowns, but why do they have to make a sexual reference to Sofia Vergara's body in every single scene that she appears in? Even in this one where she's shrouded in a huge puffy coat, like one of those frozen corpses on Mount Everest that people take selfies with. Can't we finally just let these people have some peace. I'm talking about the living women on this planet, by the way. So they're all freaking out because Jensen is playing at this party tonight. And Jensen, along with the head chef catering this New Year's party of some sort, are both meeting in this scene. And we'll see who's playing them. Good to see you, Laura.
She said that, but pretend it was my dick. And a happy new year to you, Bon Jovi. So obviously Katherine Heigl and Jensen Bon Jovi have a secret past. This is where we go back to Michelle and the bike courier, Paul, played by Zac Efron. I'm using a lot of the celebrity names in this because, oh goodness, how am I gonna remember 1,030 names throughout this movie? I'll just say a bunch of names that sound similar to what's in here and you can assign them as needed. There's a Paul, there's a Jessica, Mary and Catherine, a jokey, dopey, be Sally Assassin. Okay, towards the end, I was peppering in some that were actually interesting. I hate all of them. I hate everyone. That is a hot ticket. It's a masquerade. If anybody tries to kick you out or anyone even asks who you are, you just straight up lie. It's like Facebook, but real. Hmm, I don't think that analogy is as strong as this movie's desire to cram in that very 2011 tasting social media reference. Also, why would anyone kick you out of the party if you have the ticket? It sounds like you're saying the fact that it's a masked party allows you to sneak in without anyone noticing. In which case, you don't need the ticket. The script is literally not thinking ahead or back to what it just did. I hope both of these characters get hit by separate cars on their way home, but I've already watched this movie through one time, so I doubt that's gonna happen. This is where I transition into this becoming a Jake T. Austin and Abigail Breslin shipper. Not really. I don't care what the f people do. Ugh, actors dating. I don't care about Brad and Jennifer. I'm very high society today. I'm like, if it's not at the Museum of Modern Art, or it's not printed on a piece of parchment to hung up at the Louvre, then it shall not cross the threshold of this brain barrier. Shut up, Nicholas. Oh, P.S. Why don't we get to find out how Michelle Pfeiffer has these tickets, or let that be built into why we care about her New Year's? Maybe it was a failed resolution from the previous year to hopefully buy the tickets and have a lover to attend the party with by that night. And then we can talk about why that didn't happen. Did somebody die? Was she abused? There's like lots of ways you could go to make me care, but we don't have time for that. Back to Abigail and Breslin Sneslin. I'll stay there. See ya. Do you even know how to kiss? They have a video on the internet that shows you how. Two, one for regular kissing and one for passionate kissing. <laughs> wow, thanks for that hot tip, bad haircut Bonnie. But what the hell is regular kissing? Regular kissing? Listen, I can't keep up with all of these minute Gen Z distinctions. Call me old fashioned, but when I was a kid, we had either French kissing or full on analingus. There was nothing in between. Just like our forefather, Abraham Lincoln, and all the other bi curious founding fathers that I'm picturing in my head. Ugh, oh, no shampoo, no soap, just more powdered wigs, lice in my pubes, lice in my pubes. I'm so old fashioned cause there's lice in my pubes. <laughs> That's, That's the holiday, the holiday spirit. spirit. Okay, so Josh Duhamel is looping duping down the road in his car. He's wearing a tuxedo, he's leaving the wedding. Oh, the car skids into a snowbank and the airbags deploy so he's in trouble. Something something Hillary Swank. <laughs> there are so many check-ins that it's just like, doesn't matter. Oh, Bon Jovi goes back up to Kath Haig. I've been plotting that slap all year how I would walk up to you out of the blue when you least expect it and slap you across the face for leaving me like that. With all due respect to Bon Jovi and Katherine Heigl, I will give my file of this movie to anyone who has the time to completely edit out their storyline. These two are like when you have too many chips left over after the dip is gone. Like, uh-uh, uh, we still need something to balance out their neutral salty flavor. To which this movie responds by putting on an offensive mariachi costume and saying, how about some salsa? Hit it, Sophia. You know, I didn't even get to make you one dinner in that apartment. You walked out before I unpacked the first pack of groceries. Celebrities. They're just like us. The director said, great job bringing that non-joke to life, Ms. Vergara. But once again, your accent sort of is the punchline, so can you roll your R's a little bit when you say the word us? They're just like us. Imagine being an actor having to deliver this line and knowing full well that they expect you to elicit laughter from the audience solely by pushing your natural accent as far as humanly possible. Sofia Vergara is probably like, you know, it's weird, but in Spanish speaking countries, they actually let me play a doctor or a lawyer sometimes, but whatevs. Also, I love that because Katherine Heigl is a chef, she cares only about cooking. She's like, I didn't even get to cook one dinner for you in that apartment. Like, would that have made it better? You wouldn't be so bitter if you could have made him some craft dinner sometime? Okay, you're a chef. You're not literally made of making food for people. Whatever, whatever, whatever. It all reads a little made for TV movie for me, but this was big budget theatrical release. I should know. I almost got paid $50 for a 12 hour day to be one of a thousand people standing out in the cold one winter. In fact, obviously, this 
movie was shot very much on location in New York City, and a lot of the filming was actually done in the 2010 to 2011 New Year's, but all staged to look like the 2011 to 2012 New Year, which lined up with the movie's release. Michelle Pfeiffer's character has finally had enough of the abuse from her boss who stiffed her on her holiday bonus while also overworking her. I quit. Can't quit, it's Grammy season! I almost died today, sir. No, no. You look fine. Mm, I think that joke could have made more sense. And I'm talking about the wording of it, not the fact that these filmmakers want us to believe Michelle Pfeiffer is homely just because she has long sleeves and no eyeshadow on. Come on now, Hollywood. She's got mile high cheekbones with a postcoital glow. If that's what Mousy looks like, then we should all be in a cage and eating our newborn relatives. Because those are things that mice do, just to be clear. When you explain the joke, it makes it funnier for the people at home. Jensen Benson, Denson Denson, Katherine Heigl's mad, no one cares. Oh, Robert De Niro, when a doctor. Did I tell you why I picked this hospital? The roof has a great view of the New Year's Eve ball drop in Times Square. I heard you say I was living on borrowed time. I don't recall telling you that. I heard you tell the nurses. I'm dying, I'm not deaf. That doctor's face is like, oops, I think we forgot to tell this guy he was going deaf and then turning off his hearing aid so we could talk shit about him in the same room. That's exactly the kind of treatment I would expect from the doctor who took over for Jigsaw in the Saw movie franchise. This actor's actually played a doctor in like nine movies by this point. That's an IMDB truth. And I believe that the Saw movies are part of the same cinematic universe as this one, as well as The Princess Diaries. Call it a dying man's last wish. I've been hanging on this long just so I can see the ball drop. One more time. No, it's cold out there. I'll live. Well, you're terminally ill, so you literally won't live. What a stupid thing to say, you elderly sicko. I'm just kidding. It's actually impressive to watch Robert De Niro earn his paycheck in this thing. He's a method actor, after all. Did you know that in order to prepare for this role, he actually lived his whole life as a tired old man, 24 hours a day, for decades before and after shooting? I love Halle Berry. I guess it's time for hospice. No time. Well, is he gonna make it until tomorrow? Stop for Do you guys wanna move further away from his room when you have these conversations? I think he made it clear that he can fully hear you discussing how dead and gray his feet already look. Oi. Oh, hey, hold the elevator. Yeah, I tore down the decorations. They were my way, and according to the lease agreement, you're not supposed to decorate the hallways. Not my decorations. Oh good, we caught Leah Michelle during the era where her team was telling her to rock a smoky eye and nude lip regardless of the event or how early in the day it was. To me, her makeup always looked a little, how do I say this? Mm, easy to recreate with drugstore products. Yeah, that's a level of bitchiness I'm comfortable uploading to the internet. Back to the mother, ja, ba, ba, Jessica Beale. The couple who was in here before, they offered to split the winnings with me. And of course, I said no. What if we went 60-40? 70-30. Yeah. You are dangerously close to a rectal exam. Is that doctor going to finger you if you don't shut up? Also, 70-30, you would split it? You want your wife to induce labor at midnight so you can win roughly $7,000 before taxes? You could have saved all of that money and more by just deciding not to have a baby. So Abigail Breslin is not allowed to go meet her friends at the ball drop, even though she really wanted Jake T. Austin's character to give her a midnight kiss. So she's freaking out at her mom, played by Sarah Jessica Parker, who I, I forgot she was in this. Again basically playing Carrie Bradshaw as a mom and a fashion designer instead of a writer. She's costuming one of the shows. Anyway. You know, I'm 15. I know. Hey, but this is not a training bra. And this is not Girls Gone Wild. That's correct, because even those films know better than to portray a 15-year-old girl exposing her undergarments like that. Although I commend Abigail Breslin's character for playing that Hail Mary of flashing your bra in a subway station in order to convince your mom to let you take the subway by yourself. That's like when I would try to convince the bouncer to let me back in the bar after they just watched me take off my own puke covered sweatshirt and shove it in a recycling can. I don't know why we're supposed to care about this part. This movie sucks. Hey, you okay? Fine. You're not afraid of heights, are you? A little. Let me be accurate. You're afraid of heights and you run the ball drop in Times Square? Well, I think it's what makes Claire the best for this job. Well, I think it's irrelevant one way or the other, Chief Officer Ludacris. 
Who cares if she's afraid of heights? It's not like she has to hold on to the ball itself while they lower her from a crane like Lady Gaga at the halftime show. Also, it would have to be a pretty extreme phobia, I would imagine, if she can't even stand in the center of the roof of a very large building. And if so, she gets over that pretty quickly to go on and deliver this speech to the news cameras. Between that and the cheek thing, it seems like someone here grew up with the stage mom who pinched. Plenty of product placement in this, by the way. Okay, so this evening, we are gonna raise this ball to the very top of the pool, where it will stay until 11.59. What New York City news outlet has the time for this lady to explain how the ball will be lowered the same exact way it has been since 1907? When I lived in New York, even the public access news stations didn't get done reading off last night's murder until noon the following day, at which time they have to start reading off this morning's murders. With a quick break in between to hear from the cast of Doubtfire the Musical on Broadway, which will be running continually through two weeks ago. So Josh Duhamel gets a tow truck, no, he doesn't. The tow truck guy is like, I can't take you to the city. It's a whole funny thing. Michelle Pfeiffer is like, ju 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 ba ba I'm your next job. I bought you for the day. My New Year's resolutions. I just took care of the first one. It just says, number one, kill my boss. Not really, the first resolution was to quit her job and then the rest are sort of experiential bucket list items. But calling them resolutions really helps us stick to the New Year's Eve theme while also distancing ourselves from 2007's The Bucket List. If you can make the rest of these come through by midnight, you get these. Go to Bali? It's physically impossible. I, I don't understand what you want me to do here. Use your imagination. I'm not saying he can't be, but why does she feel so strongly that this bike messenger is gonna be any help at all in accomplishing her resolutions? It could even be dangerous for her. Statistically speaking, a white man with a personality that charming and charismatic could be committing violent crimes of escalating severity for years before getting even pursued by a police officer. But he agrees to help her, and she's like, I'll give you these tickets if you help me complete the list by midnight. I guess it's all the resolutions from the previous year that she didn't accomplish. What did you do to her? Nothing, I asked her to marry me. Then I got cold feet because I wasn't ready for it. That's horrible. You were the one who proposed. In my country, when a man gets down on one knee, it's because he either wants to get married or he's been shot. Again, I think once we all get done laughing at these hilarious Latin American stereotypes that they've recycled from Modern Family, I think that, again, you'll find it was forced into the dialogue, even when it really doesn't make sense. Like Sofia Vergara into that uncomfortably altered chef's jacket. Bon Jovi just said that he wanted to marry Katherine Heigl, but then ran out later on when he changed his mind, which really has nothing to do with the proposal itself, which is the part that Sofia's line clumsily focuses on. It would be funnier if she said, in my country, if a man gets down on one knee, he knows it's going to be the rest of his life, either because he's proposing marriage or he just got shot. See, I'm just saying, if you're gonna make a joke about whatever country she's from, that would be a little funnier, wouldn't it though? Would you laugh so hard and give this movie a huge Oscar? A huge throbbing Oscar? Oh, a huge rock hard gold plated Oscar. But Katherine Heigl is starting to fall for him a little bit, you can tell. I'll never know what sort of delicious catered meal I missed out on by not getting to be an extra in New Year's Eve, but it doesn't matter because I can cook delicious meals in my own home thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Every Plate. I've been cooking Every Plate meals for the better part of the last year and I couldn't be happier because truly before I was spending crazy prices on meal delivery services and I thought that all of them were like that. And then Every Plate came into my life and showed me that you can get these delicious fresh ingredients and amazing recipes for a much better value. In the new year, I'm trying to commit to cooking cooking more meals and ordering out less. I know I said that last year, but if you wanna give yourself and your wallet a break this year, then you can also enjoy every plate meals, which come together in six simple steps. And even if you signed up at full price, you would still get a price that's about 50% cheaper than buying grocery store prepared meals. You can choose between 17 different menu options every week, and you can swap out proteins, veggies, and sides to your personal preferences. These meals are so simple to prepare that I can do them while I'm watching TV, but I'm also building my cooking skills from week to week. Try Every Plate for just $1.79 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering code NICDOREMIO179. Are you feeling refueled and ready to hit the Times Square crowds? Cause let's get back to it. Oh! Zac Efron is giving Michelle Pfeiffer everything on her list, so to speak, in a manner of speaking. Breakfast at Tiffany's. 
take a New York taxi ride with no traffic. But who would ever put that on their list of New Year's resolutions? And she made this list of resolutions a full year ago. How was she ever expecting to do the no traffic thing? Find an Uber driver who's willing to plow through pedestrians? Because if it's me, that better guarantee a five star rating and like $7 tip. I'm gonna have to get the undercarriage sprayed next time I go through the car wash. So basically then Catherine Heigl and Bon Jovi talked to each other. I was like, okay, Bon Jovi, I guess you're an actor now. What do you want from me? Also, Michelle and Ashton are stuck in the elevator still. They can't get out. No one cares. Abigail Breslin and Jake T. Austin talk about how he's sad that she won't be at the thing. See how all of these secondary check-ins with each character literally just like inch the story forward a tiny little bit? Nothing of note. Michelle Pfeiffer gets brought to Bali, so to speak, by Zach bringing her to a like Brooklyn spa that looks very, I guess, Bali-esque. And the stupid pregnant people are trying to have their babies at the right time. And oh yeah, the opposing family is like, you're not gonna win. I know you're trying to induce labor with these anchovies. It won't work. All right, now Abigail Breslin is mad. Oh my God, explaining stuff like that, stupid. You really gotta find somebody. Look, mom, you're a hot woman. Uh, yeah, I agree. Your mom is probably very hot, especially that stripe of skin around her stomach that she keeps bound under a tank top, two sweaters, and a thick leather belt. Is your New Year's resolution to have an entire midsection made out of heat blisters and friction scars? They said, how do we pretend that Sarah Jessica Parker, an incredibly gorgeous woman, is frumpy and unfashionable? Hmm, what about like four or five cardigans? Yeah, from Carrie Bradshaw to Carol Ann Sadshaw. We live for it. She's gonna get her Oscar for doing the make under trope. So Josh Duhamel gets a ride with a nice family in an RV while Halle Berry talks to her nurse. No, no, she is the nurse talking to her old patient. Old patient gonna die. Last 24 hours to live. You've been here for weeks. First no radiation, now no chemo. Why? That's the difference, you know. I delayed the inevitable of it. When I was a photographer in Vietnam, I'd see death all the time. I just, nothing prepared me for this. Uh, if you're not prepared to die, then maybe you should try out some of that chemotherapy or radiation your nurse just mentioned. I don't know, just a thought. See how this script doesn't even try to make sense with its own dialogue? It's ridiculously lazy. I'm calling out the screenwriter by name, Catherine Fugate. What else did she write? Army Wives, Valentine's Day, The Prince and Me. What is that? Nothing, nothing much anymore. Ooh. And of course he was a war photographer. That way the audience knows he was both a Vietnam vet and never shot a gun somehow. Even though he basically just said, I used to take pictures of innocent Vietnamese people getting killed all the time. But now that it's happening to me, it's like really difficult. Abigail Breslin sneaks out of her room and jumps on the subway. Run, single mother, run! Your daughter just got onto a subway train alone and there's an entire camera crew filming her, visible in the reflection. I don't care about the visible crew members as much as I hate the continuity in this movie. Like, gosh, they really got people to just film this around their schedules or something, or over a long period of time. I think she decided. You got a hat. You got a dog. And we get that poorly rewritten dialogue meant to help explain the costume designer solution to Zac Efron's frequently changing hair length throughout the movie. They should have just added the hat and not had anyone draw attention to it like they did for Katherine Heigl's frequently changing hair color. Roots to no roots to roots to no roots. She must have a nice and easy roots touch up by Clairol. So he takes her around the world by driving around the globe in the World's Fair they're all over the place up in this. The traffic alone would prevent you from getting this done on New Year's. Plus, all the drunk drivers on New Year's Eve, you're gonna get smashed, smashed in the face. Oh, the puppy adoption was how she saved a life, so, you know. And then at the end, she's visiting all five boroughs in a single day by walking that mini Manhattan sculpture at the Brooklyn Museum of Art. I don't know what her deal is, man. She's just like a couple sandwiches short of a picnic, you know, like a little bit pathetic. And it like a cute wave. Aw, what a nice thing to say about the person who has something you want and is standing three to six yards behind you. Ingrid gets upset by this and runs off, although I gotta be clear, did she really think it wasn't pathetic? That she had to ask a perfect stranger to take her on like five different New York City public school field trips in a single day? Like what part of having zero friends and family to spend a bank holiday with did you think made you seem cool and affable? Hmm. Also again, why does Michelle Pfeiffer have no one? We never get that. We know that Robert 
Robert De Niro was mean to his old family, I guess. Like, I don't know, an asshole somehow. But we don't know why she's alone. I hope it was tragic. This Jolly Roger couple is goddamn dancing with wolves trying to have a baby. I don't know. Did you get it? Yeah. And I got a discount with my vet school ID. Oh, you're gonna make such a good veterinarian someday, Griff. Thanks. Do I look like I give a f that Seth Meyers is a veterinarian in this goddamn movie? Stop adding in random details as though that builds out any of these thin, flat characters and their predictably boring lives. I could write one of these Gary Marshall segments in my sleep. Once upon a time, there was a dumb, stupid idiot, but she was also a kindergarten teacher and she just loved to get wasted on St. Patrick's Day. Until one year when she accidentally f***s a significant older man who happens to be the father of one of her students and a secretly undercover leprechaun with piercing Irish green eyes, miniature buckles on his shoes, and hands that are tiny like a baby's but rough like a farmer's. Okay, turns out it's hard to plot movies this basic without immediately slipping into adult film territory. Now we know. Now I know. And now you know for watching it. Sponsored by The Commercials. Girl! <laughs> We're halfway through the movie now! Do you think I'm even gonna tell you what happens here? Oh, she she goes into labor, right. And they get to the hospital, it doesn't matter. Oh, and Leah Michelle reads down Ashton Kutcher by being like, you're just some pathetic nobody who doesn't like New Year's because someone broke your heart. And he's like, it's true. So I don't care. Oh, she gets mad because he sees the like ID badge she's wearing for the Jensen concert and assumes that she's a groupie. And she's like, how dare you say I'm a groupie? And I'm like, first of all, what is a groupie? Is that someone who just follows the band around? Because you know she doesn't do that. She lives in your building. Also, what? It's not that offensive, it's not true, so like, don't get that mad. So proprietary. How long you been a backup singer? Too long. I just got hired for tonight, but I was hoping that he would ask me to go on tour with him. I don't want to be mean, Leah, but I don't even think you get asked to be in another movie after this. And I'm talking about live action theatrical releases, mama. Don't get cute. Nobody went and saw Legends of Oz or Same Time Next Christmas on ABC. She did get, I think, one season of the Fox show, The Mayor. I knew that was a failed venture from episode one when they thought it would be a fun gimmick to flip out to cameos of actual US mayors on this show. Like, what the f I don't even know the name of my own mayor. That's more uh, embarrassing for me to say than anything, but whatever. The next conflict, I was shocked. When this conflict came through at 53 minutes, I'm like, God, how do we even have the time to care about all of this? But anyway, Hilary Swank's character is in trouble because the ball is not lighting up when they need it to, and it won't drop without the lights working. So they have to call this other electrician who's also supposed to be funny because he's Russian and has an accent. A lot of that type of stereotype in here, so. Oh, that's great, great, great. And it's like, even though they call out how it's, you know, absurd that it is this way, he says that one of the lights in the ball has gone out, so now he has to go through all of them and find the broken bulb. In order to assuage the public, Hilary Swank has to get on TV and make up some dumb symbolic reason about why the ball is not lowering. It's pausing so that we can reflect on the year we've had. So when that ball drops at midnight, and it will drop, let's remember to be nice to each other. Not just tonight, but all year long. If I was there, I'd be like, um, why are they playing the same news station throughout all of Times Square? And who is that lady? Is the US government being overthrown again? All right, uh, she seems to be getting pretty far. So all hail our new Supreme Leader. Toshiba? Is it, what is her name? I don't, it's hard to hear her when they don't have subtitles on. There's like thousands of people in the street right now. Josh Duhamel is in the car with this nice couple, including Nancy Cartwright, this nice family, I mean. And, and he tells a story about how he met this woman the year before at a New Year's Eve party and they had the most amazing time talking for hours, but then at midnight she was gone. She said it was complicated in a note saying if he was still thinking about her in another year, he should meet them at the Italian restaurant on New Year's. Oh, I know, I know, it's bad. Oh, things start interconnecting because Sarah Jessica Parker has to call her brother to find her daughter, Abigail Breslin. And we find out that Paul, the bike messenger, is actually Sarah Jessica Parker's brother. He's like, okay, my niece told me where she was going, so I'm gonna gonna rat her out. Meanwhile, Hillary Swank is like, that speech you're right, it wasn't about all of those people, it's about my own life. I should have never told you about him. So we don't know about the mystery man in her life that's making her sad. And also, it just came up out of nowhere. Now, at one hour and five minutes, great, timely character development, I really care. So it's finally time for these opposing pregnant couples to give birth. And I'm like, thank goodness, I hope there are no complications, not for anyone's health or safety, but I just don't think we have the time. Don't you show your head to me, young lady? 
Not yet. Oh, please don't yell at my vagina. Oh, I never will. Gentlemen, to your corners and ladies. May the best of a JJ win. Because of that comment, I'm suing this hospital for custody of every baby they have. I'm not an expert, but wouldn't it really be the one with the best uterus that wins? From what I understand about childbirth, the actual vagina has very little to do with it until the very end. And at that point, it seems like it's gonna get pretty much obliterated no matter how good it was at the beginning. No matter what shape it was when they wheeled you into the hospital, Sally. I'm just kidding. I mean, I don't know why I said I'm just kidding. I'm serious, Sally. You're p mangled up in there. I'm just kidding. That's why I said just kidding. <laughs> oh, New Year's Eve. Mm. Okay, God damn it, all of the chefs. God damn it. Leah Michelle is talking to Ashton Kutcher. He's a comic book artist. He draws her. Also, Bon Jovi gets on stage and sings a little. You can no longer see. Oh, I just got it. This is an old people movie. Now that I think about it, this whole movie was perfectly crafted so that your mom and dad can be like, oh look, it's John Bovey. It's the singing girl from Glee. And that's Hilary Duff from Million Dollar Wrestling Movie. And no matter how many annoying interjections they make, no important plot points will be missed. It's really good for that. Kind of reminds me of this movie, The Intern with Robert De Niro and Anne Hathaway. Oof, I should cover that one. Finally, as Bon Jovi's singing, our girl Leah Michelle sings in the elevator and I would be like, you're too close to me to be singing. It's weird. There's a montage. I fucking hate a montage and you know it. Remember when I took you to New York for the first time? We watched the ball drop together, remember? She's like, yeah, that's right, Grandpa. We're gonna watch the ball drop one more time, so just close your eyes and count down. Happy New Year. If you were a healthcare worker, would you be more like taking the medical oath and following the rules, or like I'm a angel of death, putting people out of their misery, like arbiter of life and death type of deal? I'm just curious. Tell me in the comments. I hate all of this so much. Okay, they swing Michelle Pfeiffer from the f***ing chords of Radio City Music Hall to do something amazing. Like, see how it's all just nothing? All nothing nothing pointless. And right before Leah and Michelle and Ashton Kutcher are gonna kiss, the elevator finally gets fixed and starts moving. You didn't, uh... It's not like that. Yeah, it's, it's always like that. This was not like that. No, it's always like that. We just met. On... Hey, I'll check out the video. I wasn't gonna say anything, but this is the third time in the movie that sex is explicitly brought up in an inappropriate situation by an older gentleman who, frankly, I wouldn't wanna see when they get drunk. Me and my girl are gonna crush a 12 pack and watch porn. I can tap this. No, you can't. You need to think about tapping your life alert button, sir, when Father Heart Attack comes creeping up behind baby New Year. Father Heart Attack coming to kill your valves. Ding. I like that this movie, it doesn't actually matter what the f happens, cause like every stupid storyline comes together so easily. Ashton Kutcher finds her bracelet, has to run after her, the baby baby thing. Oh, this is amazing, I can totally see him. What? He's coming out, you can see him? I'm sorry, did the hospital provide the Pat McGrath makeup artist that applied her foundation and that Vogue Italia editorial blush? Did Jessica Biel get her makeup done at the same time this nurse was sponging the afterbirth off her legs? She's had enough of the bet. Swearing helps sometime. But now we're gonna use our words, right? Swearing is a type of words, Dr. Douchebag. Oh my God. I wish that I could abandon this movie at a fire station because I was not ready for it and it's going to ruin the rest of my life. You're gonna have a baby I'm sister. Sorry. Love you. Ciao. Bye, mommy. I want to know what scene got deleted that explains why these children are suddenly here and how come he's suddenly in nurse's scrubs. Actually, you know what? Don't explain it to me because my dermatologist has already told me that the skin cells forming my frown lines have evolved to eat Botox and use the energy to become even deeper. So whatever, Seth Meyer wises up and just focuses on his wife having the baby. Josh Duhamel gets off the goddamn bus. A real treat getting to know you and the family. Well, you got a chance to see how the other half lives. Huh, Sam? Yeah, you guys make the other half look pretty good. Wait, was this character supposed to come off as fancy and high society this whole time? He's so likable and easygoing throughout this whole movie, I kind of just assumed that he rented that tux or worked as a catering server. Josh Duhamel is always doing these Ugh, head moves. Michelle Pfeiffer makes up with him. I didn't tell you about it, but they make up for him calling her pathetic. He's like, I don't want to be that guy whose big mouth gets him in trouble anymore. And it's like, well, you are that guy because you just were rude to her. Anyway, he gives her the tickets and she can tell she's still a little lonely. The New Year's kiss resolution didn't happen. Any ideas who you might want to kiss at midnight? Uh, 
What is this unrealistic stirring, sir? Like, no, you're not. And you can see that the chocolate in that bowl has already become more firm than the edges of my liver. Little health tip. Try to avoid drinking excess alcohol every day for six years, kids. So yeah, Josh Duhamel, his character definitely seemed to be a quote unquote womanizer throughout the movie. Definitely liked to have multiple sex partners, it seems. So I guess that's like his learning lesson throughout all of this is no longer being that because he decides he wants to meet this woman. Thank you for wearing your father's tuxedo. Perfect fit, huh? Oh, even the tuxedo itself is supposed to be meaningful now? And that's why every character has mentioned it so far? This really is quite the shitty little movie, isn't it? Quite the sh shitty little film. They could have brought that up much better. Like if he were neurotically trying to keep the suit clean throughout all of his misadventures of the day, like trying to prevent himself from like getting sprayed with mud and he's like doing everything he can to keep the jacket clean. And we assume it's because he's just stuck up and fancy and rich. But really we just find out it's his late father's. And then right before he gets on stage, like the cake falls and splatters on him. That would be funny. And they can be like, well, just goes to show, oh, excuse me. <laughs> just goes to show life is not clean and neat. Messy. That would have been funnier, but they didn't do that. Josh Duhamel just gets up and gives his stupid speech. Oh, f Matthew Mc... No. Matt McConaughey. Mm. Who's Ferris Bueller? Who's Ferris Bueller? He's married to Sarah Jessica Parker. He played Ferris Bueller and Inspector Gadget. It's gonna drive me crazy if I don't find it. Matthew Broderick. Oh my god, my brain. Oh, so Ashton returns the bracelet right to Leah Michelle before she gets on stage to sing back up. And then they finally kiss. At this point, I just zone out for every moment that they come on screen because he always looks as unhappy as her one one color smoky eye looks unblended. Looks like someone got the Urban Decay Heavy Metals palette for Christmas, didn't they, Leah? I'm so mean to nobody. To someone who's rich and famous, let's just remember that, okay? It's fine. Oh, Hilary Swank talks some sense into Bon Jovi's character because he's not going on stage to sing his final song like he's supposed to. Why? Why, John Bovey? All she wants is to not have to share you with the rest of the world. Sounds familiar. We girls, we have a handbook. It's called Using Human Empathy to Treat People the Way You'd Like to Be Treated. It's a lot shorter than the handbook they made for cis hetero men called Feeling Angry, How to Strangle Women Until They Die. So that convinces him to perform. Like, was this guy really refusing to perform for Times Square, a job he was presumably paid tens of thousands of dollars for? All because he was kind of sad and he needed someone to explain how abandoning an engagement might be hurtful to the other person in the relationship? This is the part where I let you know that a normal movie would be over in about seven minutes from this point. How is this two hours? It's not f***ing house to goddamn Gucci speech. In the past, my father would always kick things off, but as you know, dad's not with us anymore. I think that uh, anybody that knew him knows that he was a great man. But for everyone who's watching this movie, you'll just have to take his word for it. Since we never even saw a picture of his father or even really heard that he existed at any point before this in the movie. These ensemble films try to cram so many stories into two hours that absolutely nothing feels earned. We couldn't have him watching some home movies of dad at some point, no mention of him during the car accident, whatever. Like the guy who's fixing the car could be like, your dad was a great man. Oh. The dead dad's mere existence in the story is positioned as a reveal for the tux, which basically means that the audience never gets to see this character grow other than just suddenly deciding in one day that he no longer wants casual hookups. Leah's finally on stage singing her backup. That extra said, it's Nivea fucking New Year's bitch. You better wear the big blue hat. I hope you're all ready for some good old music, Hal. Why is Bon Jovi snapping and snarling in that girl's ear? Does anyone know if he got bit by Cujo on the way over here? Throughout this number, we find out one of Leah Michelle's favorite onstage moves, the pointing at the band and the open mouth cackle laugh. <laughs> She said, do, 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 <laughs> Real cool. You're like a regular Aretha Franklin up there. The Russian guy finally gets the ball fixed right in time for New Year's and they give that electrician all the glory because that matters for some reason. Ludacris meets his children. Pfft, what the f like not meets him for the first time, but they surprise him at work. And I'm like, we didn't even know he had, like, I don't care about that. That was never mentioned. They're just trying to give me sentimental images. Oh, and Katherine Heigl learns of this. Um, who was right? 
Jensen. He told us that we had to hire you or he wouldn't sing tonight. I'm gonna recommend you to everyone I know, and honey, I know a lot of people. Nazis, murderers, child touchers. It's the New York elite chef floppy hat. You're gonna be frying bacon for some of the worst people on earth. Josh Duhamel decides, oh, I can't with these sexy girls who are all wearing the same modest dress. He runs to the trattoria that he's supposed to meet his mystery date at in Little Italy. It's finally happening! The point in the movie where every storyline is perfectly interconnected using careful writing. Like just now, when those two people sort of looked at each other for a second, without consequence. So satisfying. Like, anybody can write eight different stories and then be like, oh, and in between, they pass each other on the street. Oh, connected! Like, that's really lazy. Why doesn't each character play an important role in one another's lives somehow, like Paul did with Sarah Jessica Parker? Whatever. It's literally, I'm sick of it. No, oh, I'm not gonna leave you alone. He's not alone. Hi, Daddy. <gasps> Aw, I'm so glad you could finally get off work just in time to watch your dad die. The whole time, we kind of assumed Robert De Niro was longing for his late wife, and that's why he wanted to watch the ball drop. But it was actually his estranged daughter who's been letting him rot alone for the last year. It's cute. It's cute. What could he have done that made her so mad that she was like, you can die alone? I don't know. Wish we knew. Wish we had any idea. But that would distract from the sweet sentimentality of it, wouldn't it? <laughs> Mr. Harris isn't in his bed. I know. So should I look for him? No. Don't worry about that missing patient, Nurse Alyssa Milano. I just took him off of life support so an after hours visitor I just met can wheel him up to the freezing temperatures on the roof for sentimental reasons. By the way, do you want to do morphine shots with me at midnight? I can't believe this hospital would just let, like, patients have bed sensors. Ha <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi. What do you think? Oh, I love it, I love it. You look so beautiful. And you look so evenly lit for calling from a Middle Eastern army base. Were there a bunch of ring lights in the care package that third grade class sent you? Looking back, I feel like a lot of movies from this era had a military mom or dad video calling from an assumed to be Iraqi looking background. Because apparently the entire US economy hinged on whether or not we felt patriotic about the government dropping bombs and killing civilians with drones. Oh, uh, I think I meant to end that sentence with something funny, so. <gasps> dooga dooga! That should cover it. So yeah, her husband is now suddenly in the military. This came out of nowhere too. I'm just like, okay, something sad for the kids. But you know what? This is gonna be a great new year because you're coming home really soon. I hope so. Is it just me or is her husband acting suspicious? Like he's actually having an affair with the war on terror. Katherine Heigl's upset because, I forget why exactly at this point, because she decided not to be with Bon Jovi. I honestly don't know. I'm not here to police anybody's food, but she's definitely putting those chocolates into her mouth too quickly. There's no one there to give you the Heimlich, sis. And I know I've mentioned it before, but it seems like it's very hard for an actor to lift something up naturally when they're trying to match the camera speed that's supposed to be following it. Lady, why are you choosing that truffle like it's a Yu-Gi-Oh card? She said, <gasps> The mayor comes out and helps the ball drop. One minute to go. Let's start the countdown when we hit 10. Oh, there it goes. Even if you weren't staring directly at a brick wall right now, I'm still not sure you would be able to see the ball dropping from over here. Because it's such an uncinematic, not very visual televised event. But whatever it takes to help you die, dad. I mean, to die happy, dad. But also if it happens tonight, I won't have to renew your health insurance, so just saying. The Seth Meyer couples finally gives birth right at midnight and everyone's kissing. <laughs> And that's the day COVID was created. Seriously though, did Gary Marshall have a fetish for men in uniform acting horny? Perhaps, and also, I'm projecting. Jensen and Katherine Heigl share their New Year's kiss right at midnight, even though he's supposed to be performing. Wait, if you're here, who's at Times Square? Wait again, if she's in Times Square, then who changed her manicure from short black nails to long French tips? Sister shot a full season of Emmy nominated TV in between scenes and it shows. Should old acquaintance be forgotten? 
ever brought to mind. I feel like every Leah Michelle vocal performance has to start out as a breathy whisper, just so that it can swell to a large, flat-tongued, belty tone by the third chorus. Are you about to wail at us, Leah? Also, uh, some girl who's not Abigail Breslin kisses Jake T. Austin and she sees it at midnight. So she runs into her mom's arms crying. Even though they make up later, Jake T. Austin and her, they do share a kiss just a little bit later and the mom loosens up and lets him go to Dave and Buster's. I love you. I love you so much. Okay, I'm just gonna say it. That guy did not seem very happy to see her. Why is he staring at her like the antagonist in a Fast and the Furious movie? Also, just curious, why would a computer show TV static? Even a trusty American-made Dell computer, right from the heart of Texas in the USA. Dell, where even the newest technology looks like it's from the 1980s. The product designers over there have never seen a boxy angular Xerox machine that they didn't feel inspired by. Dell said, who needs an iPod when you can have the Dell Digital Jukebox? Ah, oh, rockin'! You would think that after it's midnight, the movie could just end, but ugh, still like 12 stories to wrap up. What the hell are you doing? I'm twice your age. Final resolution. Midnight kid on New Year's Eve. I'm not an expert, but she probably meant consensual kiss. So get your American spirit mouth off of that frightened AARP member. Gary Marshall really wants us to think it's romantic to smash your face against someone else's as a surprise. Not for me, thanks. Unless you're doing it to transfer Skittles into my mouth that you've been storing like a chipmunk. In which case, happy new year. Glob me those slobber blobs. So they don't explicitly mention it, but since Hillary Swank is crying, we can assume that the the sound of the fireworks was too much for her father's heart and he passed on. Would you like to see what we do on New Year's Eve? Welcome to the world. I see trees of green and roses too. Hilary Swank is like, thank you night shift nurses. Seeing all of these newborn babies in their underbed storage bins has really helped me forget about my father's miserable death that happened literally moments ago. Thanks for cutting my grief short, super healthy. Back at the hospital, Seth actually lies about his baby's age, like the time of birth rather, in order to let the other family who has multiple kids win the money. So that's magic. Also, stupid Josh Duhamel goes to the Italian restaurant and meets his mystery woman who is terrible. Sarah Jessica Parker, who has been wishy-washy about attending a certain event all night. Turns out they were each other's thing. So it's all getting wrapped up beautifully. That was probably the best little wrap up out of all of them and also the last. So let's put a bullet in this horse. Benny Snatcher, call me up if you and that's a wrap on this Hairspray reunion featuring dozens of hairstyles by Zac Efron. I'm pretty sure I can still see a zigzag shaved into the back of his head from this from the previous summer. But that's none of my business and that's it for fucking New Year's Eve. What do you think of this Gary Marshall tragedy? I'm desperate to look at Valentine's Day now so you can bet we'll be doing that next month. But otherwise, let me know what other movies we should be covering on Clip Breakdown. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week, so turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know when we're counting down to New Year's Eve and rocking to the latest tunes on a Dell sound system. Also, I've got merch available and a Patreon where you can access exclusive bonus episodes and virtual watch parties every month. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you for old Lang, old Lang songing with me today. I will see you next time.